are you actually providing what I call the world of value? So um, it's not just a, with a CSA product. It's not just about giving them an awesome box of veggies. In many cases, the CSA customer in the early years doesn't know what to do with it. They might have a lot of energy to, to do it the first few weeks, but then they usually hit a wall. And more and more, I'm recommending to farmers that you have to embrace the role of kind of being a guide for how to actually use the product and be successful with it. Because if you give somebody like kohlrabi and you don't give them any support or suggestions, I don't even think a recipe is enough. Like, I think you really need to go a little deeper and you know, show them how to cut the <laughs> cut the kohlrabi um, up, how you take that skin off, uh, give them some several different suggestions for how people typically use it. There are even people in my CSA at the beginning who don't know basic things like a sheet pan meal or how to make a pesto. So some of it is also just teaching them some of the basic, what I call exit strategies. So just really take a look at kind of audit the user experience after they're getting the CSA. And are they having trouble using the product? If they don't feel like they're successful with it, then they're not gonna wanna come back and they're not gonna tuck it up. For regenerative farmers who may be struggling to sell CSA shares, what's your best recommendations on how to evaluate your marketing and start making improvements? I have so many things that I could say about this, Lauren. Um, so I feel like one of the first questions that you have to ask yourself is, are you attracting, finding customers? You may just not have clarity about who the ideal client is for a CSA because every product has a perfect buyer for it. And sometimes if we don't really have clarity about who's the ideal person for this, this product, who would it be easy to sell this to, then we don't often create messaging that's targeting that person. We just kind of speak a generalist marketing message that isn't resonating with the right people. And then we attract all different kinds of folks, um, some of whom might be great fits for the product and some frankly, just aren't. And so some of that is just kind of trial and error where we have to get really clear about who is the person that loves this product. And I know we're going to talk about that more in a, in a later question, um, who really uh, adores the CSA model? What are the characteristics that they have? And how do they think? What are the questions they're asking? What are the kinds of things they're valuing and looking for? And then you want to create marketing that's tapping into those words and to those values. It's almost like a person should read your Facebook post or the thing on your website and, and feel like you're in their head, like you're talking to them. So that's kind of my, my, the first thing that I thought of was like, are we, are we making sure that we actually know who the ideal client is for a CSA member? and how understanding how they think. And the best way that you can learn more about this is to actually research your customers. And you don't want to research everyone, you wanna research the ones that, that are actually liking your product, that are raving about it, that seem to love it no matter what you do. And you wanna kind of talk to them, get have phone conversations with them, try to understand what they like about it and pay attention to the kinds of things that they say. If you, if you interview like five to 10 of these people, spend about 30 minutes with them, you will learn so, so much about what is the most important part about your product, what you really need to spend time talking about. And it's gonna make it so much easier to create marketing for more people like that uh, so that you can attract very similar types of people. Um, so that's kind of my first my first trick is, or tip is to just make sure you, you do some research on who your perfect client is and talk to them, figure out what drives them. Um, there's a really great list of survey questions that I have for people. If you want to go to mydigitalfarmer.com forward slash survey questions, um, that will help you kind of collect five to 10 questions that you could use in a survey or in a phone to phone uh, interview conversation on the phone as you're trying to uncover, you know, what is it about your product that these people love? Um, so that's number one. I also want to make sure that we say, <laughs> and we just ask the question, hey, is your product good? 
<laughs> so, um, you know, maybe one of the reasons why you're struggling to sell your CSA share is because the quality isn't there. So take an honest look at your boxes every week. Are they awesome? Are they full of variety? Are they something you're proud to put out there? Are they, or are they kind of low in value? Um, you do have to pay attention to that. Now, if you have, if you feel like you have kick butt boxes and you're still struggling with marketing, um, then I think what we need to look at is, again, are you attracting the right person? But um, which was my first point. But the other thing to look at is, are you actually providing what I call the world of value? So um, it's not just a, with a CSA product. It's not just about giving them an awesome box of veggies. In many cases, the CSA customer in the early years doesn't know what to do with it. They might have a lot of energy to, um, to do it the first few weeks, but then they usually hit a wall. And more and more, I'm recommending to farmers that you have to embrace the role of kind of being a guide for how to actually use the product and be successful with it. Because if you give somebody like kohlrabi uh, and you don't give them any support or suggestions, I don't even think a recipe is enough. Like, I think you really need to go a little deeper and, you know, show them how to how to cut the <laughs> cut the kohlrabi um, up, how you take that skin off, uh, give them some several different suggestions for how people typically use it. There are even people in my CSA at the beginning who don't know basic things like a sheet pan meal or how to make a pesto. So some of it is also just teaching them some of the basic, what I call exit strategies. So just really take a look at kind of audit the user experience after they're getting the CSA and are they having trouble using the product? If they don't feel like they're successful with it, then they're not gonna wanna come back and they're not gonna tuck it up. But if you're also not just delivering the vegetables themselves, but you're delivering beyond that, you're actually helping them be successful and use the product. Now you're beginning to add what I call that world of value, right? You're, you're adding more things to the CSA experience. It's not just the food itself. So that would be kind of tip number two is to just take a look at how are you supporting the customer from week to week? And are you going above and beyond? Um, that would be a, a piece of advice I would give you just to try and see if that makes a little bit of a difference. So maybe that means making a quick cheat sheet for each vegetable that you can send with your weekly email um, when you're featuring a new thing in the box that week. Or maybe it's a video unboxing that you do um, on Instagram or in, we have a private Facebook group for our CSA members and we do that every week. So we kind of open up the box and show them everything and talk, talk them through it. So doing little things like that, that are showing them, I'm trying to help you be successful with this can go a long way. Even giving them like a little handbook that will walk them through the top mistakes that CSA rookies make in their first two years so that they don't make them, whether it's storage tips or the things you should have in your kitchen or the types of exit strategies that the veterans have figured out how to, you know, use to get rid of their stuff. Like that's information that people will find very valuable and it'll make them feel like you're going above and beyond what they expected. So don't think that people are just buying your CSA membership for the food because that is part of it, but they actually want something more than that. And if you don't deliver on that success and they end up feeling like a failure, they won't come back. So the CSA retention piece is so key. Um, if you have happy customers, they will end up marketing for you. So it's, it's worth your while to take your marketing time to actually invest in your current members and take really good care of them. And then you don't end up having to try and find new customers all the time because they'll actually eventually help you find them because they, they love it so much and they stick around. Um, so that was kind of my second point. And the third thing I wanted to say about this was um, I think you also have to ask if you're, if you're struggling with marketing, um, CSA, do you have a good offer? Do you have an irresistible offer? So simply throwing a CSA share into your online store and telling people I have CSA memberships available and not really spelling out not only what's included, but like, what's the incentive to buy now? Um, why is it important that I do this now? So creating a tantalizing offer that's really um, pointing to all that world of value that you create, all the different ways you support people, what you're going to give them during this promotion period, a special bonus that you're going to include that's only around for 10 days. Um, th there are some tricks of the trade to try and get people to like back, their, back them against a wall. 
create some scarcity and make them buy now. I think that's a big mistake. A lot of farmers just kind of put it in their store and hope people will find it. Um, instead of creating like a short-term burst of promotion energy where they make an amazing offer that can't be refused, it's the best offer all year, and they drive all their focus on it for a short period of time, that's when you tend to really get great sales, not when you just have this open-ended kind of blah, like sign up anytime. So that's, um, a, you know, a great offer is is targeted to the right place, to, sorry, to the right person at the right time, at the right price. Um yeah, and it's the right offer. It has the right stuff in it. So that's that's kind of like the three things. Is the offer itself really good? Um, are you attracting the right person? And are you helping? Do you have a plan for actually coaching your customer to success? Those are all important pieces of the marketing process. I love those. Those are such great tips. And I feel like we could spend like an hour on each of them. On each, I know. <laughs> so just, I guess, to, to not spend an hour on each of them, um, you know, when we're talking about attracting who is the right person, obviously that'll be a little bit demographic based, but have you found any tricks to people? What are some like high level traits that you're like, these are the people that stick and don't go away, or maybe these are the people you mm -hmm. think you're going after, but they're not really. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I, so I can tell you what I have found for my, for my customers. And I think there's probably two categories that we have to look at here. We have to look at who is the ideal avatar for a traditional style CSA, which is what I do, where you get what you get. The box is pre-packed for you and you don't get to decide. And then there's the avatar, the customer avatar for like the CSA that's more customizable where they get to choose. Maybe you have a little bit of like base box, but like they get to make a lot of the decisions. These are two distinctly different kinds of people. And I really want people to understand that you can't, um, you have to understand what drives them because it's a little different. So I have a traditional CSA and my CSA top CSA people are foodies. Um, I don't know if that if the choose your own adventure types are necessarily foodies because they kind of they don't always take risks in the kitchen. They don't try weird things. They like their standards and they want what they want. And that's not always a foodie. So a foodie is someone who's like wants to be creative. They can't wait to see like what I'm going to throw in there. They're not intimidated by weird stuff. In fact, they get excited about it because it's going to allow them to try something they've never tried. It's almost like I'm the curator for them of amazing, beautiful food. And now they get to try and make it look amazing. So um, foodies love thinking about food. They love cooking shows. They love experimenting. They, they don't mind making mistakes in the kitchen. They realize that that's a part of it. And they really do see this as a creative process. So they tend to love cooking as well. They probably like subscribe to a lot of cooking magazines and watch cooking shows. So they want like guidance and help um, in how to become a better chef in the kitchen with your amazing food. And so I think this is why that whole piece of advice that I gave you earlier about, are you coaching them to success in the kitchen? Like there are people who join our CSA who want to be a foodie, right? That's, and they don't know how to do it. It's like, they look at all these people in our CSA community and they're like, I want to be like Esther. I want to be like Danielle and make these amazing, cool things. And how do I get there? And so when you can actually help them do that, now they, now they feel like you've helped them develop into a better version of themselves. And you're not just giving them calories, but you're actually helping them transform into this better, amazing person um, that inspires loyalty, right? And so that's that's actually what you're what they're buying from you, um, if you kind of think about it. So foodie, they love to cook. They're also very passionate um, about supporting local. And so some of my messaging and my marketing leans into that. That that usually shows up in one of the top three responses of my customers when I ask them, you know. What do you value about this whole thing? They want to uh, they want to support a local business person, even if that means they spend more money. That's really key. We all love hearing that, right? So that kind of releases me from this fear of oh, my prices are too high. The right customer doesn't care. I mean, you can't be ridiculous, but like they they have the the money to be able to afford that. Or if they're if they don't, they value it so much that they make that a priority. So I do have customers who don't make quite as much. They're not super affluent, but this is like one of their top values. And so they make decisions in their life. They don't do some things that they can afford to, to have this really awesome foodie, food experience for their family and for themselves. Um, so valuing local is a big piece. And then just the whole like 
uh, I guess there's two other things. I would say that they want to know their farmer. No, I, I love knowing my farmer. I, I feel like I hear that phrase, know my farmer, know my food. All that's, that phrase shows up a lot in survey results for me. Uh, so that means that we have to be intentional during the season to actually tell the stories of the farm and show them how the food comes to be. Uh, so that is a big part of what I do on social media as a result. I'm trying to, I'm not necessarily doing that to attract new people, although I, it, it does have that effect. I'm actually doing it to take care of the ones I already have because I want to feed that part of their spirit. So they love kind of, they, they feel really detached from the story of agriculture. They've lost it. They feel like it's something they should know. And so when we give that to them, they feel like, oh, this is amazing. So that's something that I talk about a lot. And then finally, I would say um, community, although I don't think they know that at first, um, but when they start to find other people like them who, who love food, they feel like they belong. So this, this sense of tribe um, begins to form and that's a very powerful, um, glue that holds them in your CSA and keeps the retention high. So whatever you can do over time to, you know, push the idea that this is a community of people, you'll find your people here. Um, people like you who love to cook, who are just like you are here um, that, that kind of language I think is also really key. And when they start to experience it, if you do things like we have a Facebook group that's really active. And when they begin to see other people that are doing what they're doing and loving what they're, they're growing by watching them, um, then we see just this huge, um, that we, we see this huge bonding and loyalty begin to happen. I love it. Those are such good tips about like such odd characteristics and people. So when you're like, so you now kind of know who that person is that you really connect to, how did you kind of just start going about where do you find them, especially if they don't realize community is what they're looking for in the beginning. There's not people out there in the street saying I'm looking for a foodie community. How do you start them in that trickle of that journey to nurture them to that point? Yeah. So, you know, the, when I coach people, like, where do you find your first CSA customers? Um, Usually I recommend that CSA farmers start at like the farmer's market um, before they start a CSA. I don't recommend that a CSA farmer begin a CSA in their first year of being a farm. That's a very bad idea because it's kind of like the PhD of farming <laughs> and uh, it's hard. And so you need to know how to grow. You need to know how to make sure you've got crops in the rotation that are going to have fill a box every week. That's a lot of stress. So if you don't have those growing skills, uh, and you don't learn how to do that, you're going to have a tough time. So I usually tell people start, just start selling your stuff at the farmer's market and you'll begin to attract people there. And as you build a relationship with them, get them on their, on your email list, you know, develop that relationship through email too. Then you can begin to identify, there will be people who will rise to the top, who you will sense our potential for being in your CSA. And you can reach out to them and pitch them directly and say, hey, I have an offer for you. Remember I just talked about that irresistible offer. Um, here's something that I want to try. And I think that you would be a great fit for it. And then kind of show them, here's what it would look like. And maybe it's only like a six week trial or an eight week trial, um, just to give them a, a sense of like, this is how it could work. Um, find, so it's just identifying some of those key people you really only need like 10 the first year and I wouldn't even go higher than that. But once you have that core base from the audience you already have and the other place, like you, you have what I call traffic sources, right? Like there are other people following you on your social media accounts or you're going to markets and you've attracted people there through your relationships. You want to try and use those networks that you have already or neighbors or friends, family members who believe in you, who are willing to be those guinea pigs in those early years, who are gonna tell you, give you the feedback that you need so you can get better and better. And then once you've kind of established that core group, then um, that, that core group will actually begin to promote for you. And you can give them, cause they know, they hang out, right? Remember they hang out with other people that are like them. So they know all, they know where the people are that love to cook like them. And if you ask them, can you find me one more customer? Uh, that's, how, that's how we've done it. That's how a lot of CSA start, farmers start out. They will often help you find that next 10 to 20 people. Um, and that's really all you need is to kind of get, get started. And once you get those high retention rates, 
um, then you can begin to kind of share those testimonials on your social media. You can begin to, uh, once again, get people on your email list. You can start talking about this as an opportunity to, um, to join your CSA, that this is another way that they can support you. Um, once you identify like, hey, this is the kind of person that would do really well. But I really like to get people in with like a, a trial period. So, um, I mean, I obviously now have people that sign up for 18 weeks, but almost everyone now who comes in new, at least for the last three years, has come in through the, the four-week sampler project. So they, they buy the four-week program to try it out because we're sold out and that's the only thing they can get. And they dabble in it to see if they're a good fit. And once they realize, oh my God, I love this, then, then they're graduating into the 18 week season. So that's kind of another trick that I've learned that you offer. I wouldn't go any lower than four weeks. Otherwise you're going to attract people that are just in it for like, I don't know, for kicks, but a four week is like enough of an investment, financial investment to attract like people who are hardcore about it and who might stick. So that's another strategy for finding those people. I love that you say that and it makes it just sound like it's going to be so easy. You just provide an awesome product and you bring people to it and it's just, that's how it goes. <laughs> um, do you have any tips for people, maybe some high level stuff that you just see others doing and you're like, this is not good. Like kind of some beginner strategies that you would advocate people don't try to avoid some pitfalls. Within CSA marketing specifically? Yes. Yeah, CSA, they get started. Either do they take on too many customers? Is their website set up badly? Kind of what are your first issues you see with other people's farms? Yeah. So I'm going to go back to what I said at the beginning. Um, I think one of the big issues is that people try to sell the CSA to everyone. And the CSA is not for everyone. Uh, it's for a small subset of your audience, and you really have to understand who is the ideal customer for this kind of a product. So really understanding like who is the perfect person for this product and then building your messaging. And by that, I mean like the words that go on your website, the words that you're using in your copy, the types of pictures and themes and values that you talk about in your social media to attract them. Like you should be, you should know what it is that attracts the perfect client. And that's what you should be talking about instead of just trying to get, throw this wide net out and hope that anyone will come in. So that is a very common mistake. I think that, that people make and they just haven't taken the time to do their research and understand who this ideal client is. It's one of the best uses of your time in your early years, it truly is. Um, I also think just, so, so CSA is a hard thing for a customer to understand. Um, so if, you know, if you just say, Hey, I've got a CSA, like, first of all, people don't know what that is. Like that's a buzzword. It's an internal word that we all know what that means, but your average person doesn't at least. And maybe there are some areas of the country where that is maybe a little more well-known. Um, but there are large swatches of, of our country that, that don't know what that means. Um, so we have to make sure that we do a good job in our marketing of, um, explaining the product better. So I think that's also a common mistake that I see farmers making. They just assume that their customer has made the leap <laughs> and they're already over here and understand all this stuff. And they're still like, it's a what? It's a box? Like, you know, so trying to figure out how, what's the best way to message this, not dumping everything in the kitchen sink on your website, but like, what's the most important thing that they need to know? Or what's the metaphor, the word metaphor that I can use here to give them a gist of what this is about, get them on my email list, and then slowly explain it to them over the course of several weeks in small sound bites so that they can kind of understand what it's a lot. Or is there a picture I can show them or a video I can do that will help them in like two minutes understand what this is. So I think that just explaining, not only finding the right type of person, but finding the right way to explain it is also a, a, a really, is a problem that some farmers are, are haven't figured out how to do. They just throw a bunch of words up on the website and they don't read that through the eyes of a brand new person who might be like, this doesn't make sense. And a person is not going to walk into a relationship that is confusing. Like the brain will not do that. They will avoid, it will avoid confusion and run away. So we need to make it so stupidly caveman clear. Um, so yeah, so maybe that's just saying this is a subscription box, even though you hate saying that because it's so much more than that. And maybe that's what you say at first to help them be like, oh, kind of like HelloFresh. 
Yes. Now I hate HelloFresh. I hate the concept, right? That's my competitor. But like, yeah, it's kind of like Blue Apron, but local. Like I say that all the time. And then later on, I make sure they understand, okay, it's not like Blue Apron. Like community supported agriculture is this, right? But that's maybe not the thing I lead with because I just need to help them understand like step one, this is what this is all about. So um, that's another thing I wanted to bring up. And then I feel like another pe mistake people are making is it is not clear how to get started doing business with you on your website. I, like, like, I audit websites all the time for farms and this is a major problem. It is like all this information and you can't figure out what is step one and what is step two? And like, what happens when I click on this button? Like, I don't wanna walk into a state of confusion. So making it really clear, like having a, I call it the plan section in the website, like step one, you're gonna do this. Then step two, this is gonna happen. And then step three, you're gonna get your box, right? So that they can kind of see big picture, how does this work? And then what's the button I click to get started? And when I click on that button, wherever you take me, it's clear what I'm supposed to do there and what's gonna happen next. Um, I think that's another, another really big thing. And, and I think I would also say another mistake is that there's not clear expectations. This is something that I talk about in my course, CSA Quick Start, a lot, that you have to make sure that your customer knows um, what to expect from this experience before they ever click the buy now button. Because a lot of reasons, one of the big reasons why people have low retention rates is because their customer is disappointed, right? Something happened, it didn't go the way they thought it would go. So they had an expectation and it didn't happen. So why didn't it happen? Was it because you weren't clear perhaps in your pre-sale process for how this works? And they walked in with this word picture in their mind of like, I'm gonna have this experience and maybe we need to reset those expectations on the front end before they buy. So they realize, hey, this is how it goes. The first couple of years are actually a little hard. You might, you don't get to pick out what you want. Like, are you super clear about all of this so that we're on the same page when we get started? Or, hey, you know, we could have a, a bad like bout of rain and you don't get a whole lot of stuff in your box and we'll do our best to make it up later, but that might happen. Like, are we really clear about that before they sign up? Those are, that's another really big mistake that I see. And that's, again, a messaging, marketing kind of strategy that you need to put in place that we teach how to do in our course. Like you got to work people through that so that you don't end up with people who are disappointed later. I love that. There's so many great tips all combined in that. Um, I guess we, to wrap it up, would you like to share with other people where they can reach you? Because obviously we've just hit the tip of the iceberg on all the things you could possibly learn about CSA. Where can they go to listen to your podcast and learn more? Yeah. So I do have a podcast. It's called the My Digital Farmer Podcast, and um, it's a weekly podcast. I'd love it if you'd subscribe. I teach farmers how to become more confident in their sales and marketing. Um, so go ahead over there, listen to the first 10 episodes to kind of get a uh, marketing 101 fundamentals course. <laughs> um, that's where I'd recommend you start. And if you would like to grab one of my, I have so many free resources, but the one that I might highlight here is um, I have kind of a cheat sheet of the top 10 marketing assets that I think you should start with and have in your business or like work towards. That's a very popular download for, for farmers who first get to know me. And you can get that at mydigitalfarmer.com forward slash 10 things, the number 10, one, zero things. I love it. Thank you so much. That is so many great tips and can't wait to get people started on the CSA model. Thank you so much. You're welcome.